Thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. With your growing empire. Uh, yeah. Show my swag. Location number got. two. I got my <laughs> swag bag. Got my hustle hat, which is good for yeah. winter running, especially with my head. That's actually, uh, you can actually flip it down and wear it the other way, too. And then the logo uh, works both ways. Oh. Yeah, so you got different. Savage. Uh-huh. Bang on That's my nickname. Uh, How did you know? <laughs> and then. I had it personalized for you. And then notes. Steve oh, it's notes. got the new address. 74 West 63rd Street. Yeah. Willowbrook. Uh-huh. So when's. Grand opening. Uh, grand opening is going to be May 11th. Uh, at least that's what it's slated for sure. right now. Um, we're doing a uh, soft opening in April, April 1st, and I'm doing a, uh, a 30-day fitness challenge um, for that month to kind of, uh, you know, kind of figure out class times, what works for people, um, you know, get people, get some buzz going before the grand opening. Right, because it's what you do here in the city, your studio location in Lincoln Park, totally different probably demographic t class time as far as just yeah, when you have yeah. classes versus, uh, you know, the suburbs, which yep. who knows? I mean, I'm sure you're going to learn that. That's probably going to yeah. be new learning uh, what class times work and what don't. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in Lincoln Park, you know, we get a lot of people before and after work. Right. And I'm assuming right now, just based on kind of what I've seen from other studio schedules and what i'm hearing from people mm -hmm. we'll probably have it'll be a little more front loaded out in the suburbs with more people coming in the morning in the morning that's gonna be and then yeah. maybe it seems after like school it. program what i saw i you were on the um the fitness podcast that i had the zoom one with mm -hmm. uh pat murphy who has <clears throat> a gym up in highland park i know yeah. he does a lot of like kids programs like weekends and stuff yeah like he he doesn't do it he doesn't run he somebody runs it but they have like birthday parties there they have all this okay. i'm like yeah. it's, it's just funny just i'm like I, you're not doing this right it's like no they just people just love having out. these spaces to have kids parties you know they have i can't imagine the cleanup after a kid's party yeah. I, I, we i've been did to kids one, actually in i've been to, did you yeah, yeah we did uh i think it was like a frozen theme yeah uh, for one of the members yeah she wanted to kind of host it with her um, I think her daughter was like five or six at the time, maybe. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah, I guess fun. it goes back to culture. That's one of the things I've, um, I've texted you about things, about I've talked to people in the business, and I'm just, you know, what business each, in, I guess each type of gym has to create their own culture. Yeah. And, and, and that be, because I'm always like racking my brain, like how do we get more people in the gyms how to mm -hmm. how do we get more people that exercise and that's a whole that's a whole existential that's a whole economic that's a whole sociological question that i can't really answer i can only answer you know the gym stuff that we do yeah but like creating a culture where not only do people stay members stay member retention mm -hmm. but then they game. also have kids parties. You're having kids parties at the same gym where their parents work out. So that's mm -hmm. a culture. Like they're not going to bring their kids there to play around if they're not comfortable or safe there. So that's yeah. one way of creating a culture, I guess, inviting kids in than the parents in or the parents. So how did you notice that? Okay, now you have this gym culture at Hustle because your culture could be different than the gym down this, you know, another gym or a big chain. What do you notice as far as how? how did you know now you have a gym culture? Does that make sense? Like, how did you know that, okay, people are starting to get comfortable here. They're making this part of their lives or bringing other people in their kids are here. I don't know. Yeah. It's a I culture. Think, you know, I think a big thing for me and I'm always kind of amazed by this is when, um, like I see members, like we've been, my Lincoln park location, I've had that for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I see people, um, Facebook that, you know, I've, I've kept in contact with and then they're communicating with other members who have, have kind of moved on and have left and they're still friends. So, uh, that I think is one thing that just kind of clued me into how culture works and just how, what we have is, is kind of special and not to say that it's more special than, than anything else, mm -hmm. but you know, you, you can have, you know, different things can be special in different ways um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, just seeing how people, you know, since the mask mandate was lifted, our sessions have gotten a bit busier. Sure. Um, and that and was within the past 
I don't know, let's say what two or three weeks? Yeah, two something weeks, like something it's, like that. Yeah, officially we've seen a big uptick in in the size of our sessions, which is great. Yeah, people are you know feeling more comfortable coming in, but just seeing how people now are kind of sticking around and like chatting mm-hmm. after the session and kind of interacting and getting to know each other, and for me not being at the gym every single day mm-hmm. and every single hour we have sessions i don't always know that these people are kind of that our members are bonding or connecting in those ways so it's just it's cool to see when you know they're kind of getting to know each other and getting to know each other so they're taking it feeling. over they're taking over the culture of it saying because versus you having to create the culture like that's i guess a club culture where the members are taking it over and you just kind of let them is that <laughs> Yeah, to yeah. some degree. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think I try to provide the supportive atmosphere mm-hmm. um, where people can feel safe, feel like they're getting coached. You know, it's a fun environment where they're not feeling like they're being judged or someone is like um, better than them or like, mm-hmm. you know, critiquing them on their on what they're doing in the studio. Um you know, I think that is a, um, is a big part of like why it's successful and like the members can kind of come in and they'll know that, okay, I can feel safer, but then they can kind of be themselves and sort of create the culture there. Because if I, you know, I think if I tried to like force that on people, it it just wouldn't come off as like authentic. Mm -hmm. So kind of like, you know, creating like the framework for people, Hey, this is what we do here. These are class times. We want to do certain events, but kind of asking them, like, what type of events do you want to do? Because I've hosted stuff before where I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. And then it's like, no one shows up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sometimes it's like, well, did they not show up because of the timing of it, which is something I can change, or where, hey, were they not interested in that? So um, I've done like a lot of like little focus groups with members, just ask them like what they're kind of interested in. Um, and I think that helps and then it makes now interested is as far as workout programs intensity because that's another thing too I want to talk to you about yeah okay you have this but what is the actual programming where you you know you may have to dial it up or change it because okay you want them to continue to be successful and yeah working out but mm-hmm. okay now we got to guys we do have to ramp this up a little bit we have to you know make it a little bit harder because you guys are being successful and how do you cross that line where now it's you having to program a little bit harder because they're, they're successful, but you want them Mm -hmm. to uh, adapt and get something more out of the actual workouts. Or is that just, I mean, is that just an ongoing uh, thing? You just adapt every month, every week you see uh, the, your coaches, your trainers have to adapt and, increase intensity in these programs so they get something out of it so they're just not doing the same thing mm-hmm. i mean yeah. do you see that is that something you have to be consciously aware Definitely, of Definitely, yeah otherwise they just get stale and uh, yeah yeah um you know i mean progressive overload is probably mm-hmm. the you know number one key component of any strength training program yeah it's you know long term theory um, of just progress just adding uh more intensity or frequency could be anything could be more mm-hmm. weight more reps progressive just a little bit over time kind yeah of, that's what we're talking about yeah and so, so we do so the basically the two services we offer are personal training and group training um personal training you know we write specific workouts for people and you know based on kind of how often they want to come in like if they want to come in once a week twice a week three times a week mm-hmm. they'll get that many workouts um we have some people that come five days a week for personal training but um you know, we'll write specific workouts for them and then we'll write a new workout for them every, I would say four to eight weeks, but typically more like six weeks is, is more what it's like. Um, and then the, the workout that we're writing in that next phase, that next six weeks is progressing on what we just did. But then also with each individual workout, you know, there may be opportunities to push someone a little bit harder. I mean, I, I, I don't necessarily want somebody like going up and wait every single week all the time because that's kind of, you know, that's not really always like possible um, and not necessarily the best Mm -hmm. thing for them from like a safety perspective. Um, But, you know, it's kind of the coach's responsibility to um, know like, hey, are they ready to 
push a little bit harder today, um, which is kind of testing them out for that next phase of the workout, that next, you know, six weeks, if you will, and what is going to be the best thing for them. Um, and then something, sometimes, you know, people may have a day where, you know, they just, their, their kid was like up all night. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe they're just not, it's just not going to be a hard day that day. Right. They could still work out. They just have to kind of self monitor, just ease back. Yeah. And it's kind of them themselves and the coach just kind of communicating Mm -hmm. those things. And then, you know, the coach can kind of always adjust that workout. Yeah. And I think that's what maybe people don't maybe when they're in the gym, they think, Oh, if I can't do it the way they tell me, then I, maybe I shouldn't yeah. go. But uh-huh. they, I yeah. don't, I don't think I don't, people understand. You could still go to the gym there. You can yeah. do less intensity or do mm-hmm. something. <clears throat> You're still going to get something out of it. Why? Because maybe your body's tired or, but you still doing what you can at that level. That's still going to be intense enough. No one's yeah. saying you have to do what you normally did, but just be in the gym and work out. Yeah. I think that's what people are. They take days off. You'll get days off. Like life will give you days off as yeah. far as what, uh, if you're a busy professional, or if you have family or you're just, you know, you're, you're traveling or you're just injured or tired. If you feel good, go work out. If you don't feel great, you know, you don't know, maybe you just have to kind of warm up. And if you're injured, sure. You let your body know. And then you just kind of self monitor and you can still go. I think just, I've seen people who just for, some reason don't come to the gym because they think they have to be like on it all the time. It's like, no, that's not how you can Mm -hmm. still monitor your exercise or don't grab a heavy enough weight. It's good to move period. Even if it's a uh, punch the clock type workout where we're just kind of right. Cause you don't want to stop because sometimes stopping just, it's harder to get started. And that's kind of the hardest thing for people is the getting started. Right. Barring any real injuries that you have that, you know, obviously you can't move because you have sharp pain or something that needs to be checked out, but you can Mm -hmm. work through it because you never know. There's always things that I'm surprised with the body that you start moving it's really just your body trying to recover and you're just warming up and you can kind of work through it. Yeah. I mean, that's just what Movement is amazing is about the body. Yeah. Because a lot of, there's people that work out a lot and they work out more days a week than average, but that works for them. And then they just don't work out when they can't work out. Mm-hmm. Like, and they've built up to where they can, yeah. their body can handle Yeah. Cause that. I'm, yeah. you know, I, I'm at the point where I just, things will happen and I just can't work out like I can't, uh, I'm supposed to, or I'm just busy and you just have that day off. It's my life, you know, next day I'll be able to work out again. It's kind of Mm -hmm. built in. I don't have any set pattern anymore as far as how many days a week I'll work out. I'll work out as much as I can, as often as I can, and then it'll just happen. Mm -hmm. I'm not any on specific program, at least not yet. I mean, I, I should, if I'm training for something specific back when I used to do a lot of events, I had to, you know, set up a calendar and I would do, you know, yeah. uh, you know, some, uh, periodization and progressive over overload, you know, doing s- certain week cycles. So I'm training mm-hmm. for something specific, but now I just kind of blend things together that kind of help each other. Yeah. I don't focus on one thing, you know, and just for you, just, you have the responsibility of, you know, also programming and having the, your members, making sure they're getting an, enough workout. And I had this discussion with um, uh, Carlson Gracie Jr. at the gym a few nights. My kids were in, in mm-hmm. doing the kids class and we were just sitting down chatting about how he integrates people because that's one of those industries being in jujitsu. I think people kind of, the retention rate is kind of low. I think people kind of turn over a lot. Now it's coming back. You've yeah. probably seen it. You've been there a lot longer than I have. But he, we were talking about, well, back in the day, you know, I heard your grandfather, I don't know who, you know, used to have this program where when you come in as a white belt, you had to do like so many personal training sessions with the black before belt instructor can. before you kind of get integrated into mm-hmm. the uh, regular program. I don't know what they, you know, you can call it anything you want. So you start, you do basic fall downs, you do rolls, you do drills so you feel comfortable coming into class versus I'm signing up, I'm going to go right into the class and then you get smashed and you get yeah. uncomfortable and then <laughs> yeah. you're out. And because you're, for yeah, that... You're discouraged, diff- you don't yeah. want to come back. Yeah. Right. Um, Unless you have high, high numbers of people coming in and joining yeah. and you can retain so many of those, 
that's not happening anywhere. Yeah. I think uh-huh. in any club, yep. if that were the case, yeah, you can't retain people who are yeah. coming in, and that would be done. for any kind of concept of gym. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that I think in our industry in America, as far as you know, there, I'm at the point where I'm like. There's all different kinds of concepts now. I don't care. Find your culture. Find your club. Whatever yeah. works for you. CrossFit, yep. uh, uh, high intensity uh, yoga, whatever. Pilates. Some of these things you may have to supplement, but you just have to find your culture to stay with it, and it has to be progressive too. Otherwise, you're not going to get anything out of it. You're yeah. not going to retain members. Yeah, I yeah. think like the biggest thing, like people want to, you know, they want to be part of something. Like mm-hmm. they want to be part of that community. At least with my culture, you know, some people I think. They want to go to the gym and kind of be off on their own, which is fine. Mm -hmm. But I think most people, they want to be part of something that is bigger than themselves. And they want to work out to, you know, look better, feel better. But also it's kind of part of it is the the community aspect. And that's what keeps people kind of coming back. Um, Going back to what you said before about like having the kind of the programs and like, um, you know, the you know, periodizing things and, mm-hmm. you know, I think, uh, one thing I like to bring up too, and I, I got this from, uh, Dan John, um, about having like bus bench type workouts and park bench type workouts. So Dan John, who is he? I'm not familiar with him. Who's Dan John is a, uh, he's another, uh, trainer who, um, he was on the perform better circuit for a while, but he's also, um, they make the equipment he's an Olympic perform athlete. better. Yeah. And oh, they do host seminars too. Oh, he's a Olympian. Yes, former, yeah, okay. former Olympian. Um, I, I'm not sure how old he is right yeah. now, but he's uh, Olympian years ago. Sure. He, um, yeah, he he uh, be, kind of became a trainer. Um, now he kind of goes around and like talks and mm-hmm. writes books. Um, but uh, yeah, he he mentions um, kind of like having park bench workouts and bus bench workouts, where the park bench you're kind of you're going somewhere, but you're kind of hanging out. You're there. It's not as serious. Bus bench is kind of like, okay, now I'm more dialed in. I have an event I'm training for, so I'm going to get a little more structured with my workout. So I think looking at that mentality, it's kind of like if someone doesn't have anything they're training for, you know, they're still training. The goal is still I'm going to get stronger. Mm -hmm. But like if you are training for, say, like a jiu-jitsu tournament or a race, then it's like, okay, I'm training to get stronger for this race. And that's like the bus bench mentality yeah i mean that's where i'm at you asked me um because i would just posted something i'm gonna do uh my first series of tournaments and i have to train for it it's i don't i've trained for lots of things in my life but those are specific you know you're just whether you're doing a triathlon swim event like obstacle course you know you're just you can train for that in specific you're just running either biking swimming Skill sets, fairly normal. But now you have to be confident. This is what I found in in, in uh, doing tournaments, doing jiu-jitsu tournaments. And it's just more a matter of skill set because you can't just sign up for a tournament. You have no yeah, skills. Yeah. Yeah. You're walk- you have to have a series of skills that relate to the ad- actual event. Running, biking, swimming, we have all can do that. It's just a matter of just training a specific amount of time. But what if you don't know how to run? I'm just, I'm just being high. What if you're a human being? I'm like, I don't know what running is. I don't know how to lift my feet. I don't know stride. I don't know that. That's where you get into yeah. the technical stuff. And that's just where I was with, you know, jujitsu. I just didn't feel like I had enough library of, of, of skills to do it. And unless you're confident to go in there. You know, you're still going to be uh, mm-hmm. uh, afraid of going into events. You know, it's still kind of scary that you're not, now you're going against, you know, another person versus you're doing a race with 20,000 people. You're doing an event with thousands of people. You're just on your own doing your thing. Now you, but you, now you need a series of skills that you have someone else who knows those skills. They're going to use those against you too. So you kind of have to know how to use those skills mm-hmm. in a strategy, which is completely different for my brain, which is, you know, old gym rat kind of just racing where you just go out and run you don't really have to think about much you're just running forward you just go through a start finish or you swim start finish you get out you do something the same thing but this is completely different you can't yeah yeah, i mean now you have to have a series of skills yeah 
It's like me going into a chess match. It's kind of changed a bit. Yeah, it's like me playing you in chess. You're a master or, you know, at least been doing it for a few years. Uh I don't even know what I'm doing. I just do this. Oh, checkmate. You're done. Yeah. That's kind of how it is in a non-physical sense. So, yeah, that's different. And I think to your, your, you know, your point about like how people are, um, you know, some days they won't go to the gym. You know, it's more about consistency Mm -hmm. than it is... um, you know, what you're doing that day. It's more about like the, the total effort all together and kind of just kind of doing it no matter what, or kind of finding a way mm-hmm. to get it in. Um, cause I think a lot of people to your point, they get kind of, they kind of put it off like, Oh, well I have this going on. I'm too busy. I'll do it next week. And sometimes it's like, yeah, stuff comes up, but it's like, ultimately you still have to find ways to, to get it in. Yeah. But just like, yeah, people can be kind of intimidated too, um, but if you can find ways to get through that and and make it work, it really becomes more empowering because then you kind of take control over it and learn ways to get better, which is ultimately really motivating. Yeah, missing it sometimes you just feel that, and you shouldn't feel guilty about missing a workout either. That's just. You know, either that may be where you're at a point where it's either doing too much and then you push yourself and you're susceptible to just hurting yourself even more. It should be at a point where you can still go and feel comfortable working out, but you accomplish something. You feel better than you would have had you not gone. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, where exercise, you know, I think people just have to learn. And and this is one of the things I want to talk to you about just too, because I just, you know, there's such a a big education and learning curve when it comes to any workout, unless yeah. you're depending on what level you're a beginner, you know, you don't, nobody teaches people anything. Sure. You get some remedial, you know, class or education, maybe in school as a kid. Yeah, or it's maybe, always the first thing that gets cut, but it's like, right. <laughs> it's like, you don't know. I think people, especially with eating and okay, now that I'm working out, how do I eat? It's just this education yeah. curve that, it isn't being, that's one of the obstacles. If I were going to say that, if I always pose this question and it's a question that's, it's almost become rhetorical. Why can't we get more people to exercise? Because what right now I think our numbers, as far as how many people are actually working out, maybe 60 million Americans. And what is that population? We have what? 329 million people in America, you know, men, women, children, so maybe 64 million, but is that true? Like, are they working out regularly? What's the demographic of that? What's the yeah, breakdown? What they right. Doing what, to. Yeah. I mean, it, that's, is that the same? And does that percentage, which is breaks down to like what? 19% of Americans. How many people don't work out? Mm-hmm. It's probably, uh, the numbers are pretty high too, as far as Americans that don't work out or Americans that are, um, unfit obese, as far as, you know, those numbers are always, you know, being rotated around every year. It's always, you know, 40%. It's rising more 45% of 50% of Americans that just are what they say, uh, uh, medically obese or near that. And all the other chronic diseases underneath that, that Mm -hmm. it come from all stem from the same kind of, chronic diseases so what's that percentage it's always the same percentage right like how many people are working out is that just a revolving same 19 percent of americans because it's only the people that are educated about working out or maybe were former athletes or did they Mm -hmm. get a better program in school and they learn more but what about the people that didn't in other areas Mm -hmm. you know they do you read all these studies too or at least they do demographic studies they do regional studies of what countries what cities are the fittest or what states are the fittest and it's always like you know the lower regions of america don't work out as much it's mm-hmm. just the nature of the culture whereas certain areas major cities don't have as, have as much access to it right they don't have access to it they're not educated about it yeah. it's not programmed enough so again it's just this revolving cycle of the same percentage of people working out and how do we get the other percentage of people to work out regularly where it does shift any numbers as far as health issues, things like that? I mean, I know that's the boring part of it, and there's no right answer. 
It's like yeah, I think it's a you know complicated answer. Yeah, There's it, a lot of things. It's so yeah. many things that you can't we can't talk about. All we can talk about is what's going on now. It seems like only into adulthood when we can get a job, pay for a membership. That that's where we can start to do the regular exercise, have better health care, eat better. That's, but you know, there's got to be some kind of ramp up that Mm -hmm. word is that start, you know, we've had what programs back in the days where they tried to teach more physical education because why? Because we couldn't get enough people into the armed services that can pass the test. Mm -hmm. You know, that was just one of the things that, uh, that's where kind of physical education became part of the curriculum people couldn't be fit enough. I don't know. It's, it's a weird, we're flying here. Um, <laughs> do we can't weaponize fitness. Can we like, can we turn like this force into people to do it? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, not even if, no, yeah, that work. would be great. It's bad <laughs> enough to try to get people to do pushups and pull-ups. Right. But you know, it's one of those, okay, do we, and th- these were just like thought experiments that, you know, we're having. It's like, okay, do we take money that, um, that could be used in education because look how much money we gave schools this past two years, mm-hmm. hundreds of millions, just in Chicago alone, as far as just for the schools. And that's for, you know, various pandemic reasons. But what if we use money like that to help those programs go where we turned uh, that money into something that was uh, also very useful as far as the programs you know, physical education, just uh, some kind of exercise science uh, teaching from uh, kindergarten all the way up. They have it, but, you know, what if we did start spending more money? Would that do anything to any numbers going forward in America? Yeah. You know, growing, does that change numbers like long term? It's not going to have an immediate bump because people have to be educated. They have to become mm-hmm. comfortable. It's a process. Yeah, it would take yeah. time to see and study those results yeah and and where does that lead us where do the, do those numbers just bump up a little bit versus okay 64 million americans are working out regularly does that bump up to a third somehow of adult mm-hmm. americans maybe kids high schools does that downshift the numbers of people who have chronic diseases obesity does that make a difference i don't know i mean it's just one of those things where Something has to shift a bottom line somewhere, and what shifts that? Yeah, long term progress or just throwing more money at it as far as early education because it shifts. Well, yeah, I think that you know, if there was a, I guess, like plan or system to kind of view exercise as a health benefit, because I think now a lot of people think, and you have to figure this out right now. <laughs> on tape you have to figure this out in the next few minutes I think a lot of people think like you know the only reason you go to the gym is to to look better or you know the only reason I go to the gym would be to post photos on Instagram um, you know I, I think that if we and I think most people who work out for have been working out for a while and who it is a part of their life they do really see it as a health benefit but I think someone who's maybe intimidated to get started doesn't necessarily see it that way or it's it's harder for them